awesome. So this morning, we're going to get on into it. Um, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A bit of fire and brimstone this morning, but old school. Repent. (laughs) Hallelujah. The famous words of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, verses 2. And the phrase is also used by Jesus himself. It says, he went about saying and preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. When you hear the word kingdom, what do you think of? It's not a word we commonly use today. We don't really have kingdoms today as we see it in the physical realm. But in the days of old, countries were broken up into kingdoms. And so a kingdom is defined as a politically organized community or major territorial unit having a monarchical form of government headed by a king or queen. And kingdoms are concerned with governance, economics, defense, justice, production of goods, providing structure and provision for its people. That's how a kingdom works. The kingdom of heaven is near is referring to God's rule upon the earth, right? The kingdom of heaven becoming evident and real here on the earth, but not just on the earth, in our lives. Amen? So if 2,000 years ago we were told that the kingdom of heaven is near, where does that leave us today? Many people have interpreted this meaning to be soon. Um but it's not really what it was meant. And that's what the uh, Israelites at the time, that's what they thought. They thought it was soon and they were waiting for Jesus to rise up and overthrow the Roman Empire at the time. So they were like, great, Jesus is here now. We can all take up arms and, and go to battle and we, can, and we can see victory for our people. But it's not exactly what was meant. Some translations or other verses say, come near or at hand. So the kingdom has come near or the kingdom is at hand. But they all refer to that same word in the Greek. And it's actually a geographical reference rather than time-based. So it had nothing to do with the timing of it. It had to do with more a location. Like you are near to me right now, so the kingdom of heaven is near. So who knows here that we are soul, body, and spirit, right? That's the three elements that make us up as as human beings. Our soul and our body are our emotions and our flesh, and they operate here on the earth in the physical, right? We get emotional, we respond, I'm touching things, right? This is in the physical realm. But our spirit, our spirit man is what occupies the heavenly realm. I should, sorry, just say, I'm going to welcome my dad. My dad's come along this morning to see me. So everyone say, hi, dad. (laughs) Awesome. Um, What we need to learn is how to live and operate out of that realm where the kingdom of heaven is rather than out of the physical realm, which was awesome. It really ties into what you shared this morning, Ellie, and that's what I love about God. In the physical realm, we are driven by what we see with our eyes and what we physically feel in our bodies rather than putting our hope in Christ and believing for the miracle and the move of the super natural. The supernatural is that move in the spirit as it becomes natural to us, right? That's supernatural, right? And so I want to share with you this morning, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, it says, remember that you are at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, which means you are citizenship, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of the Christ. That word near is the same word in the Greek, right? There is is locational access for you. By the blood of Christ, you have been brought near. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. The book of Matthew mentions kingdom 49 times. And most of these are actually out of Jesus' own mouth. So to me, when Jesus is talking about a topic that much, I think it's important that we stand up and listen and hear what he's got to say. 
So here are some of those scriptures. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Matthew eleven twelve, And from the time of John the Baptist began, and from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and violent people are attacking it. Matthew twelve twenty seven to 29, and this is where the Pharisees have accused Jesus of operating out of, through the devil. And he said in response to them, and if I am empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too. So they will condemn you for what you have said. But if I am casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. For who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. And I want to point out there that he says, the kingdom of God has arrived among you. Hallelujah. What powerful words. They were standing in the presence of God and they had no idea. They had no idea what, who Jesus was at that time. And finally, just Matthew 6.33, the really well-known verse, verse. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And so what are all these things? If you read all the verses beforehand, it talks about food, drink, and clothing, your daily needs and the provision for your household. That is what you will get if you seek first his kingdom. God takes care of his people. Amen. God wants to take care of you. God, that's, that's the relationship we have with you, God. He cares about the small stuff. He cares about how you're feeling today. He cares about the fact that you're a bit worried about how your child is doing at school. He cares about the fact that you're, you're praying for one of, your, one of your children who isn't walking with the Lord or, or family members who aren't walking with the Lord or you're concerned about your job. God cares and he hears and he hears the cries of his people. So let, you gi- let me give you my quick summation of God's kingdom. It is God's presence. God presides in his kingdom. God presides presides in heaven. If heaven is God's kingdom and we have access to that presence, then why do so many Christians just go through the motions day to day, waiting for the eventual coming of our Lord Jesus to take us home? I read this really cool quote while I was preparing today. It says, The call of Christians is not to cross our fingers and hang on tight until the end, but to roll up your sleeves, partner with God, and join in the adventure. Hallelujah. Who wants to roll up their sleeves this morning? Partner with God. No more just hanging on tight, holding on till the end. Let's ride the adventure and the journey with God. And that's what living a kingdom life is all about. Hallelujah. We had good worship this morning, amen, who... Thanks to our worship team. Amen. They did an awesome job. And I find a great way to start your journey in, with kingdom living, right, and living in God's presence is with worship. It's, it's amazing how the presence of God can enter into your situation, can enter into the room where you are, like you begin to tangibly feel the presence of God as we begin to worship And most, if not all the time, when I worship personally, I start to feel physically different. I don't know if that's other people here, but as I begin to forget, as I begin to stop focusing on my problems and my issues, then I actually, like Jesus' promises, my yoke becomes lighter, the burden becomes lighter, and the shackles begin to drop off, and I'm free to raise my hands in surrender, in surrender and worship to my King, It's when we allow the spirit to come to the forefront and our emotions and our flesh to take the back seat. We allow our spirit into the driver's seat to take control. And that's why worship is so important and not something that we should neglect at all. I mean, it should, it, to me, to me personally, worship is, is pretty much number one. I'll often even worship before I open the word of God because it gets my spirit right. That's just me personally. Some people might do it in the reverse, but I like to 
remind my flesh and, and my emotions that they're in the back seat and my spirit's in control now and connect with the presence of God. Being a worship leader is a great privilege. It's a great privilege and something that I certainly don't take lightly and I think this applies to the whole worship team. Everyone, even those on the sound desk, as, they, as we are involved in, in setting up and preparing the way and, and helping lead people. Some people find it harder than others, but helping to lead people into that presence and seeing people like, I mean, we get a pretty cool vantage point from here, right? Where we, we sometimes get into worship, but it's important as a worship leader that I don't get too lost to myself because I'm the leader, right? I need to keep my eyes open and keep an eye on you and keep an eye on what the Holy Spirit wants to do and make sure that the people are following and that I am leading them into that presence, right? And so it's really important in that time of, of, of worship to allow God to take us to a place, to take you to a place. And, 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 and look, I, I'm the first to say there's plenty of times in my life I think I've learned a lot of lessons, sometimes the hard way. But when I come into the presence of God at church or at some sort of gathering and it's time to worship, that I'm too angry to worship. <laughs> I'm too angry. Like that flesh, that emotion side of me is, is really strong today. And I'm, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with lifting my hands. I'm struggling. But what seems to happen, this spiritual transaction takes place and I just force myself to sing those words. And before I even know it, my hands are lifted and the pain or the ache in my heart that I walked in the doorway is suddenly, when I walked in the doorway, suddenly gone. That is the power of worshipping our King. That is the power of taking our eyes off ourselves, right? Our eyes off ourselves and focusing on our King. I remember a time in particular when I, 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 I don't even think I was on the worship team at the time, but I've always loved worship and I, you know, I was going through a really tough time in my life. It's probably about 10, 15 years ago now. <clears throat> and I would just weep <laughs> every worship. And sometimes people run from worship, right? You get that, um, no, I can't be in the presence of God. Either A, I'm not good enough or God doesn't want to see me. As Ellie said, that's not true. Your loving Father in heaven loves you regardless. He wants you to enter in just the way you are. Or we can just be like, you know what, sometimes we even are like rob ourselves. No, I don't deserve to worship. I don't deserve to worship today. I don't deserve to experience God's presence that's full of joy and peace. So I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to put my hands in my pocket. And I'm just going to be angry. And I'm just going to be annoyed. I'm just going to be frustrated. Nope, God, sorry. I'm not going to worship today because I know the benefit and maybe I don't think I deserve it, right? But we all deserve it. We all, that is, that is living in the kingdom. That is living day to day with a loving God, with a God that cares for every little bit of your lives. And I was amazed. I was amazed that I would come to God at this time and during this really tough time. And I just didn't, I, I knew I didn't run from God. I ran to God. And I was down the front in worship every service for weeks and I just start bawling my eyes out before God and I didn't care who was around me I didn't care who saw it was about it was time for me and the Lord to just work things out not in a way that my conscious mind knows right my conscious mind had no idea what was going on it was about my spirit man my spirit man was being rejuvenated and it was learning to take over and I was learning skills, management skills that God was teaching me in those times. Hallelujah. That's not in my notes. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> the yoke of kingdom living. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30 says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. 
most of you here probably know what yo- what that yoke and that burden is he was referring to, right? It's that wooden cross piece that they used to fasten across the farm animals or the or the bulls or what have you, and then they would tie the plough to the back and it was quite heavy on the back of their necks and then they would pull the plough through to, you know, back in the days before modern equipment, right, and modern technology, right? And they used to use it. That's the yoke that he was referring to, right? So picture yourself now with that on your shoulders. A really, really, I mean, I do, I do, as some of you know, I do a lot of, a bit of weightlifting and stuff at the gym, right? As that weight gets heavier, it's hard to hold, right? If I'm back squatting a heavy weight, you feel it as you lift it out of the rack, right? That's, that's the burden that Jesus was talking about, that weight that is weighing you down. I mean, I can barely move when that's on my shoulder. The idea is I'm meant to go down and up <laughs> at least once, but that's really hard, right? But walking around with that every day, I could only imagine how difficult that would be. And yet that's what often we choose to do, and especially people who don't know Jesus. That's the burden that they're carrying around, and sometimes we don't know what's going on in someone's life. And we do a great job of covering it up, right? We do a great job of putting on the face. Even here in church, we know how to be the happy, clappy Christian. You know, how are you going? Yeah, I'm great. Praise Jesus. Everything's awesome. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. We know the Christian ease, right? But it's about being honest with God and being honest with Him. And Jesus says, like, we get rid of that burden. We take on His burden, which is light. It's nothing at all. It's nothing at all. It is easy. And He promises to give us rest. I believe Jesus is telling us here, among other things, to choose to live a kingdom life. Jesus' life is the epitome of kingdom living. He's telling us to choose to walk in the Spirit rather than out of our flesh and our emotions. That is a choice. He's telling us to choose. And that is the choice that we all have. When Jesus became flesh, he became body, soul, and spirit, just like you and I are. Some people find that concept really quite hard to to get, that he was God, but he was man at the same time. So the same things that you and I struggle with, he could struggle with, right? So that he could understand. He could understand what it is like for us. He took on the emotions that you and I feel, and his body also had the, the physical limits, right? We read many a time that Jesus had to pull away to go and rest. Now, the God in heaven doesn't need rest, amen? The God in heaven doesn't sleep. He's awake all the time and he sees everything going on in your life. But when, in, for Jesus, when he took on the same skin and bones that you and I had, he understands. He understands what it's like and the limitations that we have. Our job is to follow Jesus' example, and bring the flesh into alignment with the spirit so we can begin to operate out of that spirit more and thus operate through God's kingdom. I'm going to use a bit of an example here, which I have used before, so but it was a very long time ago. So hopefully none of you remember. (laughs) Luke chapter 13, verses 20. Again, he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to. It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into 60 pounds of flour until it was worked all the way through the dough. Who here likes bread? Who here likes freshly baked bread right out of the oven? All right, well, I didn't do that (laughs) because I had a big week and I didn't have time. But Here's one that I did prepare earlier. Bought from the bakery this morning. Probably should have undone the twisty tie before I got up here. Now I'm going to touch it so it's not for anyone else. I'll be taking it home. When I picked this up from the bakery, it was warm. Oh, so I'm going to take this home today. And I imagine our family's going to have a... Mm, I've probably got flour in my nose now. (laughs) Sourdough loaf. Baked fresh today. Beautiful. So imagine that your life (laughs) is this loaf of bread. Hello, Rebecca. This is your life. It's like, this is your life. It's not a book of all the story tells. It's a loaf of of bread. The flour is your flesh. And the kingdom of God is the yeast. The end result is being that loaf of bread, our daily life. 
Will it be a loaf of bread baked fresh every day? Makes your mouth water as you lather it in your favourite topping. I have peanut butter and honey. <laughs> I don't know, I know my uncle used to love butter and Vegemite. Right? Oh, so good. Oh, fresh ham. Yeah, we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, is your life going to be represented by that loaf of bread? Or is your life going to rep be represented by this one? The one we buy out of convenience. There's extra preservatives in there to make it last, but you know, you kind of dig around after three or four days or five days and it starts going a bit, mm, doesn't taste quite the same, right? Yeah. You've got to put it in the fridge in Queensland, not in winter, but in summer, because it gets too hot and it goes mouldy in a couple of days. You know, you'll eat it. It's okay. But it's not this. Mm. Who's going to go and buy a loaf of bread now after, <laughs> after church? Hallelujah. I know what I, I want my life to be, right? The interesting thing with yeast is that you actually only need a small amount to make a large difference in the loaf of bread. Now, in the analogy comparing that to our Christian walk, that's not to say we rock up to church once a week and that's enough. Definitely not. Hands up if you eat food every day. Hands up if you eat food multiple times a day. Yes. Unless you're, unless you're fasting. Hands up if you eat too much food. Now, hallelujah. Let's pray. <laughs> hallelujah. You need to spend time on your spirit man every day. Every day. And I interpret this to mean that you actually only need a small amount of God's kingdom but you need it on a regular basis for it to permeate through your whole life. As you get your daily intake of food, are you getting your daily intake of God? Amen. So what is the function of yeast in baking? When I Google it, it tells Google, good old Google, it tells me that yeast serves three functions, which I find amazing here in the analogy. So Christ knew what he was talking about. Number one, the production of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is generated by the yeast as a result of the breakdown of fermentable sugars in the dough. The evolution of carbon dioxide causes expansion of the dough as it is trapped within the protein matrix of the dough. I would say using the kingdom of God as the yeast in your life, that it gives you a full life, a life full of purpose. We all know the really well-known, best-selling Christian book, The Purpose Driven Life. The byline for that title actually is, what on earth am I here for? Personally, I, have, I haven't read that book. It's, it's, um, I, I, don't, I don't know why, I've just, have, I've just have never read it. But I can show you a book that gives your life purpose. I can tell you about a man who will give your life purpose. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. This is the book. And I suppose that's why I was taught at a very early age that this is the book that will give my life purpose. If you need to know why you're here and what Jesus wants you to accomplish, this is what you should be reading every single day and getting it, feeding your spirit man, feeding your spirit man every single day and getting to know the heart of God. <clears throat> Number two, the function of yeast. Causes dough maturation. I hope I'm saying all these words right. This is accomplished by the chemical reaction of yeast produced yeast produced alcohols and acids on protein of the flour and by the physical stretching of the protein by carbon dioxide gas. This results in the light, airy, physical structure associated with yeast leavened products. So yeast causes the dough to mature, which gives the bread some of its best qualities. Who here agrees that things get better with age? Hallelujah. I hear those say over 40. <laughs> um, wine, cheese, life in general gets better. I don't know about you, I'm certainly a lot happier now 
in my 40s than I was, giving a lot away, than I was in my 20s or 30s. You know, I thought I had it all then. We, th- we think we want to be young, but as you progress through life, especially a life walking hand in hand with our God, especially a life walking hand in hand with our God, it gets better and better and better. Number three, development of flavour. Hallelujah. Yeast imparts the characteristic flavour of bread and other yeast leaven products. During dough fermentation, yeast produces many secondary metabolites such as ketones, higher alcohols, organic acids, and other stuff. Some of these alcohols, for example, escape during baking. Others react with each other and with other compounds found in the dough to form new and more complex flavor compounds. These reactions occur primarily in the crust and the resultant flavor diffuses into the crumb of the baked bread. Now, what did Jesus tell us about flavor in Matthew 5? You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Jesus is saying, don't lose your flavor. And how do we maintain our flavor? Accessing God's kingdom and making it real in our lives. Hallelujah. How am I going? Pretty good. I wanted to finish by giving some practical application. Hopefully the Holy Spirit's already been speaking to you about your own life, but I wanted to give you some practical application for how do we do this? How do we step out of that walking in the flesh to actually walking in the kingdom? And some days it's harder than others, and I don't profess here to have it all sorted, right? There are days when I don't get it right, all right? But But I remember I come back to the cross, I come back to worship, I come back to the Word of God and ask Him to help me, ask Him to help me get it sorted. So this is that this is that daily Christian walk, right? That we're constantly working out. We don't have it. We never have it right. Don't ever think that you've that you've got it sorted. Usually, it's that's the day that then the crisis hits the next day, right? So I wanted to just give some practical things for accessing and operating out of the kingdom. Because sometimes I think when you're caught in that rut, you know, we do sometimes get in a rut, right, where things are just difficult and we kind of can't see out. We're like, Lord, I can't. I don't know how to operate in this space I can't I just feel so down I'm, I may be suffering some some depression or really really bad anxiety and that's okay like that's that's Christians still can suffer from those things but it is through God that we choose to overcome right we we work with God and the Holy Spirit to overcome those things so I'm going to break it down into the fi- into five parts of our fleshly body where we can make a conscious ep- effort to operate more out of the spirit than out of our flesh. Hallelujah. We were talking about yeast earlier, just before, and you only need to start with a small amount of the kingdom of God. So don't be overwhelmed. Sometimes, you know, I even know it's being a Christian a long time. Sometimes, or previously, I used to put this burden on myself that, that, you know, even now having the pastor title given to me, I'm not worthy of that title. I don't feel like I'm worthy at all. And so, oh man, I'm a pastor. I should be doing this and I should be doing this and I should be doing this and I should be doing all these things, right? I should be reading 10 chapters a day. I should be preparing spare sermons. I should be praying for the church and I should be praying for my kids and I should be praying for my community and I should be seeking God's face and I should be learning to operate out of the gifts and I should be getting prophetic words for people. And then I should be also praying for Pastor Harry and then I should, I don't know about you, but I'm just tired saying all that stuff, right? And I work full time and I have two young children and a husband and a household, right? And so sometimes we become guilty of putting that pressure on ourselves. And it was a little while ago and and Pastor Cole shared a bit on it last week and I, I shared with him after service that I did get this revelation a little while ago myself that it actually doesn't matter. Because as long as Jesus is number one, and as long as God is number one, and as long as I am focusing on him and moving all of him, this is not a works-based relationship. Every other religion in the world is works-based. You have to do so much before you get to the next level. 
The top level is accessible right now for you in God, no matter where you are right now, no matter how unworthy you feel, no matter how burdened you feel. Once those doors are open, you have full access. There's no levels. There's no, you know, tier one, tier two, tier three. There's no hierarchy. The hierarchy is God and then us. That's it. Right? Or the Godhead, let's just say. The Godhead and then all of us. I am no greater in the sight of God than you. You are no greater in the sight of God than the person next to you. God loves the drug addict in the street just as much as he loves me. And he loves the pastor of the mega church that preaches to 10,000 upon 10,000 every weekend just as much as he loves you. That's the God that we serve. Amen. Also not in my notes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So here we go. <clears throat> Number one, walk with kingdom feet. Psalm 37 verse 23 and 24 says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, we're allowed to stumble. Okay, stumbling is normal, right? He will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. We need to walk in step with God. The best guide for that on a day-to-day -day basis is the Holy Spirit. If you have trouble hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, then just ask God. In your prayer time, ask God to make it clearer for you. My best advice on hearing and hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit is if that voice in your mind is telling you something that is good, that is pure, that is uplifting, and that is based on biblical principles, let's go with the fact that it's God and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. If you don't know, let's just go with that principle and then start acting on it. If the Holy Spirit is asking you to share something with somebody, if the Holy Spirit is asking you to send someone a text to give them an encouragement or uplift them, that's the Holy Spirit, right? That's not necessarily just your voice. They kind of sound like the same thing, except my voice is nowhere near as good as the Holy Spirit's voice. I know that, right? The more you obey, ob obey that voice, the easier it is to hear clearly and you eventually find yourself responding to that voice with complete and total confidence and boldness because God's always stretching us outside of our comfort zone, right? Hallelujah. Sometimes you want to rest from the stretching. But God wants more for us. That's walking with kingdom feet. Number two, work with kingdom hands. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11 to 16. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. This is Paul talking to Timothy. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift. Your gift. We all have different gifts. Which was given, given you through prophecy when the body of the elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. We all have a gift. Amen. And everyone's gifts, multiple gifts, are different. My gifts are not your gifts and your gifts are not my gifts. Right? God's given us all gifts. And this week coming ahead in your, in your, you know, your Monday to Friday, your working week, whether you be paid employment, whether you do some volunteer work, whether you are stay at home, hardest job in the world, raising kids... Be the best that you can be. It said in there in that scripture, be diligent. Be diligent. If you're asked to do something extra, don't do it begrudgingly. Work like you are working for Jesus. The more you exhibit the character of Christ in your work, you will be amazed at the miracles and the doors that God will open in your workplace. I am blown away by what God has done for me in my workplace. It is not me, it is him. Because I have said, this is impossible, this will never, ever, ever happen. 
That's what I've said because that's what I saw in the physical. Because I knew my intellect would say, I can look at the market, I can look at this, and I can look at that. In the physical realm, that's what I can see. God said, well, I don't operate in the physical realm. I operate in the spiritual and nothing is impossible for me. And I've seen God open incredible, incredible doors for me in my workplace. He does the same for you. I know he does. That God, God is amazing. He turns up when we are diligent and faithful in our workplace, giving it our all. Work like you're working for Jesus. That's what I, I like that idea. Work like you're working for Jesus. That was work with kingdom hands. Number three, speak with a kingdom tongue. I've got a few scriptures from Proverbs here. Proverbs 12, 18. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Amen. So we need to speak healing. Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Are your words positive or negative? Are you a negative Nancy? Or are you a positive penny? I just made that up. <laughs> Let's give her a name too. <laughs> positive penny. No one likes a negative Nancy. Who knows negative Nancys? I've known negative Nancys or it's just like, you don't want to be near them. It's such a downer. Like they're just, woe is me. Life is hard. I can't win. Blah, blah, blah. And you're just like, man, just snap out of it. Let's change your language. Sometimes we get caught in that, Right? And thankfully, we've got the Holy Spirit to give us a tap on the shoulder. Sometimes, sometimes the best way I can listen to the Holy Spirit is to shut up. <laughs> shut my mouth, says the Holy Spirit. And I go, okay, Lord, we need to change our language. And that way we can lift people up rather than pull them down. And that is speaking life. So we've got speak healing, speak life. And then Proverbs 15.4, the soothing tongue is a tree of life but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Do your words have a calming effect on people? There are certain people that I know that are really, really blessed in this way, like they have a natural gifting from God. And I, especially if I'm down or I'm feeling a bit blah, they're people that I want to talk to, right? Because their words soothe me. They soothe my heart and they soothe my spirit. To be honest, this can be one of my weaknesses. I tend not to have the soothing tongue. I'm I'm, I'm very direct, especially in my workplace. I, I'm not a waffler, you know, what do they say? Men are headlines, women are the rest of the paragraph or whatever. I'm a headline person. I'm like, I don't have time, get to the point. But sometimes I hear the Holy Spirit say, no, take a step back. Take a step back and spend time with this person, right? And, and, and I need to make sure that my words have, an, have a calming, soothing effect on a situation, and for that, we need to speak acceptance. What is the benefit of speaking with a kingdom tongue? Proverbs 10.31 says, From the mouth of the righteous comes the fruit of wisdom. Hallelujah. But a perverse tongue will be silenced. What is the fruit of wisdom? Living a blessed life. Right? When we're wise in all of our decisions, where God is evident in all of our decisions, right? We live a blessed life. Now that doesn't necessarily mean everything we see in the physical, but it means waking up every day and knowing the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I know that peace that surpasses all understanding. And that is what I operate in and out of, regardless of what my physical body and my emotions might encounter that day. Remember at the beginning, it's a choice. It's, Jesus said it was a choice. <clears throat> Number four. Love with a kingdom heart. Love with a kingdom heart. Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And I also want to share John 15 verse 12 to 17. 
This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide and so that whatever you ask in the Father, the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. God is love. Amen. And therefore the foundation of God's kingdom is love. The type of love used in both of those scripture scriptures is agape. It's not the love that you give when you've received. It's a love that you give unconditionally. It's a love that you give to your enemies. It's a love that you give to a random person in the street. There can be no relationship or the relationship could be bad, right? That's when agape love kicks in and that's the love that is used every time it is mentioned in those two scriptures that God is, Jesus was telling us. Agape love is a love that is unconcerned with the self and concerned with the greatest good of another. Agape isn't born just out of emotions, feelings, familiarity or attraction, but from the will and as a choice. There you go again, it's our choice to do this. Agape requires faithfulness, commitment, and sacrifice without expecting anything in return. We need to exhibit agape love. We need to love like Jesus loved, regardless of what what somebody's done to you or what you may think of them. And you might not even know them at all. The Holy Spirit is is, is talking to you and telling you to give love. Then give love. Ask God this week for opportunities to show people his love. I think this is what the church needs to come into a revelation of again. Because we don't need to win over people with flashy lights and big stages. We don't even need to win them over with fancy words and and great sermons and an awesome worship team. That's not how we win them over. How we win them over is love. Because there's too many people hurting in this broken world. I don't know where I would be if I did not have Jesus. I don't know where I would be. And I praise God all the time that I met him as a young girl. Because I can tell you what, for those, I mean, when we go through teenage years, right? Woo, that's a lot of fun. (laughs) Not. (laughs) And I remember having major dramas with friends and like, you know, we look back at it now and we just think, oh, just kids, right? Just teenagers. My heart was broken many, many times. But because I knew the love of my father and I knew the love of Jesus Christ, I learnt from a very young age to run to him, to run to him and to sit to him and say, Lord, I don't know what to do. But I knew he loved me no matter what. And even times when I walked away from the Lord, I wasn't attending church regularly and I felt a bit lost. I never, ever stopped with my word. It probably wasn't as regular but I would pick it up when I was feeling really down and really alone and I'd read from it and I eventually found my way back to church. We are told not to forsake the gathering. I can tell you as a testimony in my own life that when I forsook the gathering, I fell away. I fell away because I didn't have the brethren around me to support me and lift me up. And thankfully, because I had relationship with with Jesus, a personal intimate relationship with him, I knew who to call on in those moments. I knew who to speak to. But it's really important that we find ourselves in a church and fellowshipping with other Christians and we can pray together and we can believe together and we can love one another and we can support one another. That is what church is for. It's not about what you can get out of it. We get benefits, sure. As I said, when I love coming in here and getting and worship time, I love what it does for my spirit. I get that out of it. But it's not what I'm here for. It's what can I give? It's what can I give to help others and to lift others up? That's love with a kingdom heart. The final one 
is think with a kingdom mind. And this can be pretty hard, I'll admit it. A lot of us battle in our thought life. And it's okay, sometimes thoughts come into our mind and I'm like, that's not of you, Lord. Get out of my head, right? And that's what we need to do. We need to learn to take control over our thoughts. We have power in Jesus' name to control that. We have power to say, no, you're not welcome here. Get out of my head. I'm one of these random people. I remember Pastor Lenny. God bless Pastor Lenny. He's not with us anymore, but he used to share... He shared this sermon one time and I identified with it straight away because I'm one of these other random freaky people. He goes, I'm one of those that just drives along a, a bridge and in my mind's eye, I'll see the bridge crashing and, and breaking down and all the cars piling into it. Or I'll be sitting on a balcony and then I'll see myself jump over the balcony. That's, <laughs> well, it's quite funny if you, you know what I mean, but I mean, That's not godly thinking. Hallelujah. That's the enemy coming into my thought life. Now I can choose to listen to those thoughts. I can choose to give life to those thoughts and to dwell on those thoughts. There's also also thoughts about sinning, right? There's also thoughts about, you know, you could go and do that. You should listen to that. You should watch that show, right? But then I know that's not godly. I know that that content in that show is not righteous. It's not uplifting. It's not wholesome, right? And then I tell myself because I have a choice, no, I'm not going to watch that. No, I'm not going to listen to that music. You know, sometimes when I'm feeling a bit kind of flat, who here loves 80s music? I love 80s music. I love it. I'm not saying 80s music is not godly. <laughs> I don't want to say that. But I love 80s music. I play, And sometimes I'm just in a bit of a mood and I'm just like, I just want to sing song, right? And I just chuck on my 80s music. Holy Spirit sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes will quickly tell me, no, 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 no. You need Christian music right now. You need worship music. You need to lift up your spirit right now. And it's hearing the, that voice and operating in that time to allow, okay, right, there's something going on and I might not be consciously aware of it, but I'm going to hear that voice and I'm going to obey that voice and I'm going to do what the Holy Spirit's telling me to do because God knows, right? God knows better than I know, right? His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts, right? And that's why we need to keep our thought life in check, right? Very, very quickly because I think that that's where we end up opening the door to things. That's when we open the door when someone upsets us and you get angry with them and you get frustrated and we allow ourselves to dwell on that thought. But that's not of God and because then that thought opens the door open a little wider and then they'll do something again. And that's the enemy knowing that you've opened the door. So he's like, right, there's, a no- there's an opening now. I'm going to see if I can make that opening a little bit wider. Right? And all of a sudden, your world becomes chaotic and things start falling down all over the place. And we can make a choice. We can make a choice to say, you know what? I'm not going to allow this to take a hold in my thought life. I'm not going to allow these emotions to rise up inside me. I'm going to take dominion over them. And to be honest, you know what I do? I put on worship music. That's what we do. It's what we do in our household. When things are a little bit tense, we put on worship music. We allow the presence of God to to minister to our spirits when we may not even consciously realize it. How am I going? It's 10.30. All right. Hallelujah. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. Who here wants to be equipped for every good work? Who here wants to operate inside the governance, the structure, and the provision of God's kingdom? Amen? Who here wants to live in the kingdom of God right here, right now? Hallelujah. That kingdom is near. What that means is it's there and you're here. You have a choice. You have a choice to go, well, I don't want it just to be near. I want to be in it. I want to stand and operate out of the kingdom of God 
every single day. That is a choice that you make. It is a choice that you make every single day. Paul says, I take up my cross every single day. We don't have this worked out, right? We don't have this worked out. We've got to come before the Lord every single day and go, today I'm going to choose to operate out of your kingdom, God. I'm going to choose to operate out of the kingdom in heaven. And you will see miracles and you will see the super become natural supernatural hallelujah you will be you'll begin to see god do things that you thought were impossible because that is the god we serve amen hallelujah hallelujah we've hit 10 30 so i should probably stop hallelujah amen amen let's bow our heads and pray dear heavenly father god we thank you for this morning we thank you all god that you can help us make that choice. You can help us make the right choice to choose kingdom living, to choose kingdom thinking, oh God, to choose to love people as you loved people, oh God. That is a choice that is before us every single day. Lord, Holy Spirit, help us. We ask you and cry out right now to help us access that kingdom in each and every day, in each and every area of our lives, oh God. Holy Spirit, speak to us ever more clearly clearly than before, oh God, so that we know it's your voice and that we can act in confidence and act in boldness. Oh Lord, give us opportunities this week, oh God, to act out your kingdom, to show the lost that there is a way, there is a truth and there is a life and his name is Jesus Christ. And we thank you, oh God, for those opportunities now. Give us boldness, oh God. Give us courage, oh God. Take us outside of that comfort zone, O Lord, Father. Lord, teach us to be more like Christ. Be more like Jesus. We thank you, O God, for moments with you this week, O Lord. Moments in our quiet time. Moments even in the chaos, O God. Lord, that there would be a revelation of your presence, O God. We thank you for this. We pray again for Pastor Harry and Pastor Silas there at home, O God. Bless them. Enrich their lives this week, O God. Give them revelation, O God, a new level in you, a new depth in you, O God. Lord, I pray for everyone here this morning, O God, and even those that couldn't make it, O Jesus. Take us to that next place in you, Lord God. We want to know you more. We have a heart, oh God, Lord, that is seeking your face. Take us to that place, oh God. We worship you and we adore you and give you all the praise and honor and glory this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah.